fun. Let's go home, sorry. You know, it goes way back when my uncles were still with us. And they made an attempt to go over to Scotland to bring the pole back. And uh, that was a while, a while back. Just they're all not with us anymore. But uh, it's been a really, really long time, and this this was on our minds for quite a while now with Amy and myself. So we decided that we should go and uh, see the pole and see if we'll bring it back home. And and to us because this is really spiritual to us. And this pole is spiritual because it's, it's our ancestors, our great, great grandmother. So we have to get her back on, on home soil. And just going over there, we can f feel her, the sense of her with us. Until we went to the pole in Scotland and we laid our hands on it, it was, it was tremendous. So we knew there and then that we had to get them back home. So today coming back and coming back on Niska lands, I was telling them that they are home now. And that meant everything to, to all of us, even the whole Niska nation. So just adding in, um, when I first felt the pull when we went to Scotland for the first time, I shared this before, but um, do you want to see this? Yeah, so I, I've shared this before, but when we first saw the pole for the first time, even before we went into the room where it was, we could feel it. And I could feel like the room was breathing. And it was like, I looked at my cousin Shauna, who was behind me, and she said it was like the room was breathing with a sigh of relief. And that was the first time I've ever um, felt uh, a pole so strongly. And every time the pole has moved and I'm close to it, I just start to feel anxious. I was feeling anxious um, before it was landing in Terrace and it landed and it was okay. Um, and then this morning, I couldn't sleep. I got two and a half hours sleep last night and I just was anxious and I woke up and when we we're following the truck, uh, my partner told me to go to sleep. And I couldn't sleep on the ride in from Terrace to here. And I was just anxious. And then as soon as um, the pole came onto the lava beds, my body just released and I felt a sigh of relief. And I fell asleep for five minutes and, oh, and it was just almost oh, like a parallel feeling uh, to what I think the pole went through when we showed up. So just, I think, or, um, I just feel at peace knowing that it's here, it's home and just grateful for so many people that have made this day possible with us. story with that is because this is one of the richest uh, you'd have to say in BC the river the Nass River where all uh, the different species of fish flow and one of them is the Olakins and so back then we had nations from all over the whole coast going all the way down the other way and up the other way coming through here and, and, and coming for Olikins and even trading before they started getting into trading. And um, they used to come up through here and then we have trap lines where the family lives on, on both sides of the river. In my family, we do. So that's where we get all our food and our hunting that we do. So back, way, way back in the day when our great, great, great grandmother had this pole commissioned and uh, carved, it had to do with her grandson that was going to become the next chief in the house and the name was Nis Zog. So in protecting the sides of the river, and fighting with people trying to come up along there, he, they had battles 
lawn there and he was just protecting his own home soil and he got killed in battle when they were fighting. So that was the story of Zhao on that pole. That was his ne uh, her nephew. Yeah. You know, we hear a lot about repatriation and ever since with the, with the TRC and MMIW, do you feel that this poll coming back home from another country should be a signal to the museums in the United States and in Canada to bring them back home? You want to go with that one? Yeah, I, yeah, most definitely, and I think that every time uh, we we have um, success like this, it's a collective win for all Indigenous peoples, and we hope that it is also inspiring and giving uh, colonial institutions um, just further support in terms of doing the right thing, in terms of supporting rematriation and repatriation processes with Indigenous peoples, and that um, they continue to move forward in their practices and even looking at our own story, like what, what, what a shift has happened in 20 years from the time that the first delegation showed up and were told no to now. And certainly, like we, we talked about, we had some bumps along the roads in terms of our negotiations, um, but we had a very different welcoming at that museum than our, our former, former delegation did. And so I would hope that moving forward that museums are actively seeking us out um, that they are recognizing that anything was taken during the potlatch ban from 1880 to 1951 was taken during a time of duress, uh, taken, through, uh, taken at a time of extreme genocide uh, that we're going through, and that most of the belongings within their collections are um, questionable in terms of whether they should even have them in their possession. And so they should be actively looking towards us and connecting with us and doing what they can in order to um, support our connection back to those belongings without ha us having to do that, right? So uh, I think it's time for museums to um, to continue uh, walking on that road with us in terms of reconciliation and decolonizing uh, their practices. I think um, President Clayton had a good response. Thank you for the uh, question. The um, truth and reconciliation um, process, this today was a very um, historic day for um, the Nisqan Nation, and it marks the beginning of true reconciliation when it comes to um, bringing our ancestors home, bringing home our um, artifacts that were taken without consent. And it's going to um, uh, be a tremendous um, uh, show of um, precedent setting what Danis Arth and his house did for the Nisqa Nation because we can negotiate with those uh, custodial agreements that were negotiated into the treaty. Thank you. That's a very good question, thank you. The, uh, I was a part of the um, uh, return of cultural artifacts identification process we had during negotiations. And it was only within Canada that we did that. But the individual families like Mr. Austin and his work went out and did the research that, uh, and found where their pole, and they always knew where um, their pole was, and they worked at it. But I'm sure, and I've been told by members of our nation that they have polls in other countries that they want brought back. Well, if I use the ones that are in Canada as well that need to come back, um, did I misunderstand that? No, you didn't. Uh, it, it requires negotiation of, um, uh, between our government with the uh, respective museums. Germany, um, as well as Canada? Are, are there other nations that you're looking at? 
are there? London. The pardon? London. London. There's London, England. There's a there's another memorial pool at the British Museum, and then there's one in Paris. Yeah. How are talks going with getting back from Washington to Michelle? I haven't started yet. Uh, those are um, currently um, have yet to be um, begun. We have um, and through um, Teresa's office, we have to look at uh, working with our um, wolves that have uh, to come forward to identify. Their artifacts. The, the speaker said that this was a way to put those countries on notice. Is that a fair mm -hmm. assessment? Yeah. The NISC are coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Dr. Perrin, you spoke um, about repatriation and how it's um, uh, particularly significant to um, your culture here. Can you talk a little bit about that? Why it was significant and important to? highlight that and have that be um, um, such a, I guess, a key piece of this whole process. Yeah, so I, I talked at length of what that story, um, but I think it's important just to share that I don't have a background in museum studies and that nobody ever sent me to total pole rematriation <laughs> school or repatriation school. I have a PhD in education and my actual research is now in, in research governance. Uh, so this has been a journey for me to learn uh, from many other experts and from our respective leadership at the same time uh, about this process. Um, but it, it just began to sit on me that the word repatriation didn't fit and the more that we learned about the story and about um, our ancestral grandmother and her strengths and everything that she did in her time, um, it seemed ill-fitting to call this a repatriation. And so recognizing that we are a matrilineal society and um, that's important for us to return to that and also to look at the complexity of what that means now in a modern era after the residues of uh, the Indian Act. Um, but what it means for us to move forward, I think, as, as, as a self-governing nation and to have strength from that and to return to the teachings that we have and to continue embodying them and uplifting um, all those within our community in order to create that sense of balance and that sense of unity with each other and those important roles and responsibilities that each one of us have within our community. Yeah. And just to follow up for, for Nice Child, um, it struck me hearing you tell the history of the poll that this whole story started with a woman, with a matriarch. Um, yes. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts on the fact that it gets to come full circle now um, in this way that is honoring the women in the Well. The thing was, this was the, this lady was um, my great 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 grandmother, and she was um, she lived to be 115 years old, and her husband was 105, and he sat on that first negotiations table uh, with uh, the nation. So, going back 115 to today, she would have been about 190. Pretty close. <laughs> but I feel uh, that this, this coming full circle was everything. It, it, it was something that we've waited so long and my uncles did when they were still here with us. And one of, one of her, uh, the things about her was she had four daughters, and one of the daughters was one of my grandmothers. And she had 21 children. 18, 18 of them were my uncles, and three of them were sisters. And one of the sisters was my mom. So that's how we come to full circle and seeing this happen and I was left here to carry this out I guess and my uncles made me stand with them about just about 32 years ago. So I guess they, they left me for something to do to take care of. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was curious about some of the struggles that you had initially in Scotland and how those can kind of be uh, maybe avoided in the future or smoothed over in the future. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I 
think just recognizing that there's always going to be a clash uh, when we're engaging with settler colonial institutions and their worldviews and the ontolo ontological and epistemological understandings of what these belongings actually mean to us. And so uh, most museums still continue to use words uh, that really are not relevant in our way of being. Um, they tend to uh, use words like artifact and objects. Um, they see these as um, forms of capital. And for us, they're about relationships and belongings, ancestors, cultural treasures. So I think that's, that was the first, um, first difference that we experienced. Uh, we also had to engage with a one-year-old policy uh, from uh, the National Museums of Scotland, which we understand was put together with really good intent um, and really with an understanding of wanting to be able to return uh, some of these belongings outside of uh, the UK context, but also um, still fairly steeped in Eurocentric criteria. Um, and so recognizing that these policies still required uh, our belongings to be released to a national government uh, to a national museum uh, were a couple of things that we were concerned about, um, but we did learn uh, later on that um, it was meant to sort of be a bit of a blank slate within the policy itself. And so um, we did our homework and we were re really grateful for our partnership meniscalisms and that's when it really became very, very, very um, important to um, us to be connected with niscalisms and and to receive that support and to make the argument that we are a national government, that we have a treaty, that we have provisions under Chapter 17 of the NISCA Final Agreement, and that um, we did have a national museum and this was our national museum. Uh, so those were some of our initial, um, I guess, tensions and concerns that we had walking into the room, but I think also the other piece uh, that stood out for me was the requirement to have written, uh, written evidence and a written claim. And certainly we had done that. We had written uh, articles in advance and we challenged the Colonial Archive based on testimony from our respective chiefs. Um, so we had that in there and that was sort of checking our, our I's and dotting our T's. Um, but we also brought them into the room with us and after about an hour and a half of discussion, it didn't seem like um, they, that we had to really make it very clear that what was happening in that room was uh, foundational to our orality as uh, President Clayton has already spoken about. And that the requirement now to go back and then to, to re-engage re, re with their policy and to rewrite everything that they had just spoken in that room um, was very, rather ethnocentric and also um, making us do double the work. And so we were grateful um, within, that, within that first meeting that that was understood and that they were willing to engage with us in an oral process although they still wanted to write it down uh, and then um, I guess the next tension came in terms of you know, who writes it down and from what perspective. And um, I, I, you know, I continually talk about the need to challenge uh, the sense of neutrality with these institutions and giving them the power to tell our own stories. And so I think I'll stop there uh, in terms of some of those tensions because I think those would be very common tensions with any type of, um, and Teresa you can jump in here, but any type of rematriation, repatriation process with most um, colonial institutions uh, currently. Um, yeah, so, th th so those are some of the things that I think we had to work through um, and, and just also to speaking to the strength of our own laws uh, which go back um, from the beginning of time, from time immemorial, 10,000 years, and you compare that to one-year-old policy. But what I've learned in the process through all of this is that it's never the policy itself, it's the people behind the policies. And when you begin to make those relationships with people and we want to talk about reconciliation, then it's really moving those people in their hearts more than their minds and their hearts to do the right thing. And I think that's a power of what we did uh, through our songs, through our dances, and through, through the ways that uh, we presented ourselves in that first meeting. And so I think it's being, being able to form those relationships to encourage people to challenge the policies or to be more fluid in terms of how they understand things were really important for us. And, and we were grateful to have made some very strong allies uh, through that process and, and to understand it from their perspective well, as well. And I think another important point, perhaps, and I'm going to stop here, sorry, I'm lecturing now, but um, and then another thing I learned uh, is, you know, the context is everything, right? And so, um, especially in the UK, um, when we first walked in that door, I kind of had a side conversation with a friendly staff member, and so there's this thing called the cultural wars over there, 
And I'd never heard about cultural wars until I walked into that room. And so I think it's also really important to talk about the pushback from the elite conservative right wing, uh, right wing groups anywhere. Um, but in, in the UK, it was really the pushback from the cultural wars and also the need to ensure that the museum was fulfilling its legal requirements so that we didn't get sued from these very wealthy individuals who had the power and the money to be able to um, challenge them. And so that was sort of, I guess, a, an undercurrent that I learned about, but I think it also um, sort of guided the need for the museum to feel that they had to follow that policy in order, in order, in order to dot their I's and check their T's. So um, it was a learning encounter for me as well. I'll, I'll only add, because I think you covered that beautifully, um, reconciliation in, in the sense of these negotiations between a national institution and a sovereign nation, the Niska Nation. Um, that involves both sides being at the table, both sides being respected, the laws and traditions and cultural interests of both sides being represented. But most of these policies and procedures are only written from one perspective. And so I think that today, if the same colleagues from the National Museum of Scotland were working on their policy, they likely have a much broader view of the kinds of people that need to be around the table when those policies are crafted, rather than making them from within and, and requiring everyone whose belongings you hold to somehow meet just your worldview. And I think that, that likely uh, they have been changed through this process mm -hmm. in a very positive way. Hi, um, President uh, Clayton. Uh, tomorrow is uh, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. I'm just wondering after today what to do for an encore. That would be very difficult. <laughs> today was uh, an incredible um, journey for uh, niece Arthur and his family and the um, poll and that alone uh, for me represents um, truth uh, and reconciliation truth for the injustices and uh, reconciliation for the um, poll recognizing that um, the poll really belongs in its uh, ancestral home the Niska lands Uh, thank you. Uh, um, it was said many times outside that this is bringing an ancestor home. And that made me think about the Nesca Nation's stewardship of these lands and waters. And I was wondering if any of you could tell me more about those connections. <laughs> so, I'm going to need about um, two days. Yeah. <laughs> That's a loaded question uh, and something that um, perhaps we can sit down. Uh, you're with NAWA? Yeah. Yes. I think it's important going forward that we sit down and discuss the connections of um, the nation with the lands and the nation with the waters. two children and he just said uh, today is going to mean everything for them they're going to look up back on this day for the rest of their lives and they're going to remember this day they're going to remember this poll and they're going to remember what we did and they're going to remember this feeling and for me it represents the um, need for not only our government but our, our museum to get the um, information out to the schools NISCA schools keep it alive and to look at um, how we can move forward with carrying on the story of East Ospol because it has to be told. Uh, we are an oral um, uh, nation, 
we share our history orally, but there are times like this day that we're going to have to share with our children so that they can move forward and share it with um, their children and their children's children so that uh, we can carry on the history. So yeah, also thanks to Samaga East All, we're, we're also making a documentary as well on the rematriation process. So um, that that's you know this this is where my educational background does come in, and I actually I get really excited about being able to share stories and to be able to create resources. So we've been actively um, documenting our process with uh, with our Aniska filmmaker, and uh, we hope to have the film uh, complete within uh, about six months' time. Uh, we just got to work on the editing process and funding for that piece, but. Um, we're getting there and uh, learning a lot in terms of that and in terms of also um, some potential curriculum connections as well. So definitely always open to that and how to support that in order to carry that story forward. Can, can I'll just add that the museum, there's a, a, a number of ways that this mm -hmm. museum is very different from an institution that might have held NISCA cultural belongings elsewhere. One of those is that every summer when we're the busiest because of course the weather's lovely like today and people travel into the valley and find discover the niska museum youth from the community provide interpretation they learn how to speak publicly they share their culture mm -hmm. and that perpetuates that information and knowledge into the future um, and so instead of labels on the belongings in the collection Instead, it's that interface with a member of the community, a youth in particular, that provides the interface for visitors to come. And I think it's a really incredible um, model. Um, and it's true to their, true to Niska culture, um, and it's a unique experience for visitors who come to the museum. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, uh, when it comes to First Nations, this is not unusual when it comes to artifacts or items that were stolen or taken or whatever it may be. Do you, does Nishka have a plan to put together a template, lack of a better word, where it can help other nations navigate this process of getting their family items back? A number of other nations have approached Niska Museum and Niska Lissoms to request the opportunity to speak to individuals that were involved in those early processes, and we have hosted a number of them here at the museum. Um, but I think that's, that's important, right? Not from an institution's perspective, a, a colonial museum institution describing how repatriation, rematriation could potentially occur, but instead, how, how the nation centered its own laws and traditions in their approach to those institutions to demand their cultural belongings back. Just to add, that's a very good question. I did ask uh, Mr. Robinson, Andrew Robinson, for a template. Uh, I used, even used the word uh, template because I knew that um, uh, members of our nation would be coming forward to see how they can do it, how they can move forward with that. And uh, we can uh, look at developing that uh, kind of plan of action for our nation. It's in the works. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I believe that uh, President Clinton, do need to head over to the feast. Uh, so are there any final questions before we wrap? Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Good. Okay, let's go have a feast. <laughs> 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 yes. Okay, I'm going to come to you. I don't need to hang up on the field. Am I going to be too so much? Okay, we're fine. Thank you so much. 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 Thank you.